card. I have money to get. Uh, so, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dylan and Noah from MIT here for uh, today's welcoming speaker. Dylan uh, got her uh, initial education at the University of Colorado and then went on to get uh, master's degrees and PhDs at MIT, working uh, in Mike Watson's lab uh, doing silicon photonics. She started her independent career at MIT in 2020 and has rapidly um, established an incredibly creative and exciting, as, as you'll see today, research program in integrated photonics uh, across a broad range of different application species, spaces, materials types, device types uh, that, that I think it, it's quite interesting. Uh, a lot of people agree that, that her work is incredibly interesting. She's won uh, a number of awards already, including uh, she was uh, a DARPA plenary speaker uh, in 2018. She's uh, recently gotten an NSF career award. Uh, she's uh, been named as a Forbes 30 under 30 listee in 2021. And of, of particular interest to this crowd, she was a finalist for the uh, Evo Wolf. Uh, best paper award at bio last year so really excited to have uh, Yelena here and for your talk awesome thank you so much uh can you guys hear me all okay yes yeah, yeah. yeah. fabulous thumbs up all around fabulous well i think i met a couple of you guys uh see you guys at, at lunch but for those of you who haven't met me my name is Yelena Nakov. I'm a professor at the uh, MIT Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department, and it's a really a wonderful honor for me to come and introduce you to some of the work being done in our group um, at MIT. And I really want to thank uh, the whole department for inviting me to come and, and yeah, uh, you know, introduce you to some of this, this work. So our group works on silicon photonics. Um, maybe just so I can make sure I, I set the stage here correctly. Can you see a show of hands? Who knows what silicon photonics is? <laughs> All right, got a couple a, a couple of uh, people who haven't quite raised their hands. Who knows maybe what integrated optical phase arrays are? I see just a couple of hands. Fabulous. Well, we can set the stage then. Um, I'll give you an introduction to, uh, uh, in general, silicon photonics. We'll take a look specifically. We'll take a look specifically at uh, an area that our group is focusing on, which is this field of integrated optical phase arrays, um, and introduce you to the work being done by our group. Uh, the field of optical phase arrays first came into play for LIDAR sensing for autonomous systems. So I'll talk you through some of our, our work in that space. I'll then introduce you to what you could do if we make visible light optical phase arrays, integrate a thousand of them on a completely transparent chip that sits in front of your eye, and projects three-dimensional holograms <laughs> for augmented reality. We'll then look into what you could do in the near field of these integrated optical phase arrays, specifically looking at biophotonics applications, flexible wafer bonding, uh, chip scale solution for 3D printers, and uh, some work in trapped ions for quantum systems. So let's start first with integrated optical phase arrays, an introduction to them, and their primary motivator, which is LiDAR sensors. So if you could take a look at an autonomous vehicle, like we're showing here, this is the Ghoul car. And if you take a look at the instrument sitting on top of the car, this is the car's LiDAR module. And what that LiDAR module does is it sends out a pulse of light. That light pulse goes out, it reflects off the surroundings of the car, it comes back. And then based on the time delay of that light pulse, the sensor can calculate the distance to that reflected object. Then this entire sensor spins around mechanically to create a three-dimensional map of the surroundings of the car. Now this allows us to have a very high resolution way to do three-dimensional mapping using light beams, but there's a number of limitations with these current LiDAR sensors, right? They're these big mechanical sensors sitting on top of cars. Um, historically, they've been incredibly expensive to fabricate. So they're limited in the economic, economical scalability and feasibility. For example, as a graduate student, maybe you're having a little bit of a hard time even paying for the car. Now imagine having to pay tens of thousands of dollars for that LiDAR sensor sitting on top of it. Also, because they're mechanical systems, you can imagine some mechanical degradation or slippage over time. So if your beam is pointing in one direction, if there's some degradation in the mechanical parts, you could have a slight deviation in the angular uh, position of that beam. It's gonna have a huge effect for these autonomous systems. 
um, especially for uh, places like Rochester or Boston, where we have a lot of uh, bad weather, right? And then third, a uh, big limitation, and I think the biggest limitation with these current LIDAR sensors is they're operating with this pulsed modality. We call that time of flight or TOF, time of flight LIDAR. And that limits to uh, that lim limits these LIDAR sensors to sensing on kind of the um, near or mid-range sensing. They can't quite get out to the couple hundred meter range that's really required for autonomous vehicle applications. So there's a need for a new type of LIDAR hardware and specifically a way to get that beam to steer around non-mechanically. And that's where this concept of integrated optical phase array really comes into play. So the general idea behind these optical phase arrays borrows heavily from its radio frequency counterpart. Right, we can have an array of antennas, just like radio frequency antennas. And then by individually controlling the phase and amplitude emitted out of each of these antennas on, on its own, you can control the phase front that's emitted out of the array itself. And you can actually get these beams to steer around non-mechanically in the far field of the array. Now this concept is great, but it's been really hard to realize with bulk optical components. But when we turn to silicon photonics, where we can integrate thousands of little optical components on a single solid state microchip, we can now show integrated optical phase arrays with greater than 10,000 antennas on a single millimeter scale optical chip. Right, this allows us to have a very low cost, compact and high speed method to do non-mechanical beam steering for applications like LIDAR sensors or the other applications that I'll talk about in this uh, seminar. So I will preface by saying that there's been a lot of fabulous work in the silicon photonics community in uh, this space. So actually the very first demonstration, a uh, real demonstration of an optical phase array on chip was done by the BATS group in Ghent all the way back in 2009. So they showed a lot of the principles that we now use with optical phase array technology. But I think the issue is that at that time, we didn't quite have the scalability to integrate to many antennas on chip to think about how can we integrate the driving electronics. So there was quite a bit of a lull in the field. And then all of a sudden there was an explosion of all new results uh, kind of in the mid um, 20 teens uh, where we're seeing a lot of fabulous work coming out of many many groups all around the US and the world. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through all of these uh, great results in detail today, but I'll focus in on the, the work being done by our group at MIT. So for those of you that maybe raised your hand at the beginning and said you don't know what optical phase arrays are, um, let me talk you through what one of these optical phase array systems could look like. We call this specific guy the cascaded architecture optical phase array. Also, I'll just mention um, as we're going through the slides, feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions if anything is, is not clear. I'm super happy to answer any questions. Um, so at the input to the system, we would have a single optical um, input, maybe coming from an optic laser, maybe coming from an integrated laser. And that laser uh, light would come into our dielectric waveguide. Um, hopefully, I think probably the majority of you have had an intro to dielectric waveguide. The idea is that we have confinement in two dimensions, and that waveguide is going to guide our light on the silicon photonic chip. So that light comes in and it snakes around the system in what we call this bus waveguide here. Now, if you remember from your electromagnetics dielectric waveguide lecture, in a dielectric waveguide, we have these evanescent fields on the side of the waveguide. Does everyone uh, kind of remember that? You have most of the mode is confined in the center of the waveguide, but then you have these dielectric uh, field tails. So what we can do is we can place a second waveguide next to that bus waveguide, and that causes a little bit of the light to get tapped off and coupled into that second waveguide. So we go from the bus, we can tap off a little bit of light here, tap off a little bit here, tap off a little bit here, and bring those waveguides to this row of waveguides over here. Now, how do we get the light to actually emit off of the chip? We place these grating-based antennas. So what that looks like is we have our straight waveguide on the chip, and then all of a sudden we introduce perturbations to the side of the chip. And those little perturbations are going to cause the light to scatter up and out of the chip. And if we design them correctly, we can get that scattering kind of almost uh, perpendicular to the surface of the chip. And because we have multiple 
of these antennas on the chip, those uh, light beams are going to coherently form a beam in the far field, just like you learned in your electromagnetics uh, phased array class. You have that coherent beam forming in the far field. Now, of course, we want to steer that beam around. To do that, we can, on this bus waveguide, dope the silicon and place these thermo-optic or electro-optic phase shifters between the little path waveguides. And what happens is when we, we dope the silicon, if we apply a voltage across that doped silicon, we cause the phase of the light that's traveling through that waveguide to get shifted or modulated. And that phase is going to kind of shift as it's going through this bus. And if you remember from the animation that we just looked at a minute ago, that sh phase shift is going to accumulate. So there's going to be no phase shift to the first antenna, high phase shift to the second antenna, two five phase shift to the third, and so on. And it's going to cause a, a ramp in the phase that's applied to those antennas. And that ramp in the phase is actually what causes our beam to steer in certain directions. If we increase the voltage, we're going to change the slope of this phase ramp, bless you. We're going to change the slope of this phase ramp, and we're going to get beam steering in the array dimension. Yeah, I see a question back there. Thank you. I guess, like, how sensitive can you get them in terms of like the slope, like? Oh yeah, so you'd want you'd want quite a bit of slope to get a higher angle, um, and how sensitive you can be with setting those phases is going to be very much determined by the driving electronics. What voltages you apply to these phase shifters? That's a great question. So we apply voltages to these phase shifters and we induce this uh, slope in the phase that's emitted out. We change a single voltage and we can actually change the direction of beam steering of this beam in the array dimension. That's beam steering only in the array dimension like this. How do we get the second dimension of beam steering? To do that, we actually change the wavelength of the light that's coupled into the system itself. That change in wavelength is primarily going to manifest itself manifests itself in these grading-based antennas. When you change the wavelength of the light, the period of those little perturbations, the effective period is going to change with respect to the wavelength, and you're going to get a change in the emission angle out in the antenna dimension. So in this way, we have a two-dimensional beam steer. We can change the voltage to get beam steering in the array dimension. We can change the wavelength to get beam steering in the antenna dimension. Again, this is just one example of an optical phase array architecture. We've done a lot of, of other system um, engineering for, for similar type of optical phase array uh, systems. So I don't have time to get into all the details on, on these LiDAR um, optical phase array based sensors, but I'll maybe just flash you through some of the, the results we've had in the last few years. Uh, this is primarily work that, that I did during my PhD with Mike Watts. So at that time, we were developing a 300 millimeter wafer scale fabrication platform in collaboration with SUNY Poly um, in Albany, which uh, maybe you guys are, are familiar with them. Um, we developed this 300 millimeter fabrication platform that's now actually the basis for AIM photonics. So if maybe some of you guys have taped out in the AIM active process, um, that's based on this, this platform we developed here. We have wave guiding layers. And then we have some dope silicon connected to some metals that allow modulation of those wave guiding layers. We can then use that platform to show actual optical phase rays on chip. Specifically here, we were showing um, where we were powering this optical phase ray, getting beam emission out and seeing beam steering. Of course, we don't want just a single frequency laser. But we want to be able to tune the laser output to get that second dimension of beam steering. So we also showed some tunable laser results. Um, to control the voltages for actually driving all those phase shifters in our optical phase rays, we have to think about electronics integration with our photonics. So in collaboration with SUNY Poly, we developed this 3D heterogeneous integration process where we fabricate a 300 millimeter photonics wafer and separately fabricate a 300 millimeter uh, CMOS electronics wafer, and then we take the photonics, we flip it over, we bond it to the CMOS electronics, we remove the silicon, and then we uh, pattern through oxide vias to allow direct control of the electronics, um, direct control of the photonics with our integrated electronics. And then we worked in collaboration with Vladimir Stanovich's group to show an optical phase ray directly driven with CMOS electronics um, in that heterogeneous process. Of course, we don't want to just do beam steering. We also want to do LiDAR sensors. 
Uh, so again, don't have time to go through all the details, but here's what one of these uh, single chip LIDAR sensors could look like. We'd have a transmit array. It's emitting the light off of the chip, reflecting off a target, coming back to a receive array. And then there's some integrated photonic components that are doing coherent detection of that received light to be able to get the uh, distance and velocity of that target. Again, done in collaboration with Vladimir Stanovich's group for the CMOS electronics that's driving this thing. So I'd, I'd love uh, to talk to you guys more afterwards if you have more questions on some of this uh, LIDAR sensors. I know I've had to kind of rush through it. So we did, uh, you know, if you look at, at the um, literature for optical phased rays, almost all the, the work so far has been thinking about how do you create these optical phased rays to create beams in the far field to steer these beams around to do this LIDAR sensors? Um, but we've been recently thinking about, could you, instead of doing this beam steering, could you actually take these optical phased rays and show them at visible wavelengths and then integrate a thousand of these little optical phased rays on a single chip, make that chip transparent and put it in front of your eye and actually project holograms for augmented reality. And we call the system VIPER, which stands for Visible Integrated Photonics Enhanced Reality. So let me talk you through some of the motivation for this work and some of our recent results. So I'm showing you here a photograph of an AR display. This is the Google Glass. Maybe a show of hands. Who all has tried maybe one of these before? Okay, I see a couple of people. So I'm going to say some things that are limitations of the cur these current AR displays. And you guys can make sure I'm not just like totally making it up, okay? So if you've ever, if one of us uh, was, had one of these guys on, we'd be able to tell because these displays are not um, very discreet, right? They have some micro optics that are taking information and projecting it in front of us. Uh, for those of you that have tried them on before, maybe this is kind of the view that you'd see. I see a couple of nodding heads. Yep. Um, the information that's projected with these current AR displays is limited to a very small area of your vision. This is because these displays have a limited field of view. Also, for those of you that have tried them on, did you try them on indoors or outdoors? Indoors? Indoors? Both. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, so usually when people try these on, it's indoors because the information is actually pretty washed out uh, if you are wearing them outdoors because they have a, a limited luminance. You see that? Fabulous. And now this is the biggest limitation with these current AR displays. Um, these current displays are projecting information on a single focal plane. So for example, if I was projecting information about Jaime who's sitting there in the back, um, my eye would constantly have to change its focal plane from him to the display plane, back to him, back to the display plane, back to him, back to the display plane. And what causes your eyes to focus on different planes is the tiny little muscles in your eye. So if your eye is constantly having to do this refocusing, it causes uh, your muscles in your eye to fatigue. And it causes eye fatigue for most people. And for most people, it causes headaches. Um, it's a very well-known effect in the AR display industry. It's called the Virgin's Accommodation Conflict, and it limits long-term usage of these kinds of displays. And I see a nodding head there. Perfect. Um, so there's a lot of these limitations with these current AR displays. And what we've been working on is to create a silicon photonic solution that solves all of these limitations. So the idea is that we have a single transparent chip. Mm -hmm. it's, it's completely transparent. It could be integrated in a, a pair of eyeglasses, and it wouldn't be able to tell it's there. Um, so it's very discreet. Also, uh, it's actually projecting full holographic information to project information on many focal planes so that it resolves this virgin's accommodation conflict and it enables long-term usage of these kinds of displays. So very quickly, a summary of how this looks like before we get into the details. We have an optical phase ray that acts as a pixel in this AR display. Uh, this optical phase ray is now operating at visible wavelengths and it's modulated using integrated liquor crystal based modulators. And then we can integrate many of these optical phase ray pixels in a two dimensional grid. 
And each of these optical phase drains is now going to project information with both amplitude, phase, and phase gradient encoding to have a more complex phase front that's projected towards your eye to actually create holographic information, as opposed to just amplitude information that creates image on one plane. So let me talk you uh, through some of the, the work that we've done in this space recently. So of course, the, the first uh, um, challenge was could we actually create a chip that you could put in front of your eye and see through it? For those of you guys that are working in silicon photonics now, if you took one of your chips, you put it in front of your eye, uh, you couldn't see through it because it's based on a silicon uh, wafer, handle wafer. So we worked in collaboration with SUNY Poly to actually create a 300 millimeter wafer based on glass. And here you can see my student Milica, she's holding one of these 300 millimeters uh, wafers here that's fabricated. I promise that she's not just holding her hands there, there's actually a, a wafer there. Uh, we then take that wafer and we segment it up into chiplets. Uh, so here there's actually three chiplets in this gel pack. Um, it has ha very high transparency, low distortion. Um, and then of course we can see uh, Milica holding up that chip to her eye um, in the viewing modality that this Viper display would be used in. Next we wanted to test um, to, to develop a large scale passive version of this AR display. Uh, the goals here were, can we actually create a system of a thousand optical phase rays on a chip that's working together to do something? And then second, we wanted to test this holographic image encoding methodology. So here you can see a schematic, uh, kind of simplified schematic of that passive display. We have an input waveguide here that's taking light from a laser, coupling onto the chip. This is a silicon nitride waveguide. We can no longer use silicon because silicon absorbs visible wavelengths. So we have to switch to nitride. We then take that single nitride waveguide and we split it up into 32 waveguide rows. On each of these rows in the display, we place optical phase ray based pixels. Here you can see three pixels uh, per each one of these three rows. Here's a zoomed in view of one of these uh, passive Viper pixels. We take the waveguide and we kind of widen it to a certain width, which we call a phase taper to encode the phase, absolute phase of the light that's coupling into that pixel, depending on the width of that waveguide. We then again place one of these evanescent tap couplers to tap off a little bit of the light and we encode it to um, deliver some amplitude of light to this optical phase rate pixel. We have our bus waveguide here. Maybe this looks somewhat familiar to that cascaded array that I was showing you earlier for LiDAR. Here we have the bus waveguide and then we have a, these little tap waveguides that couple light from the bus to an array of grading based antennas over here that are emitting the light off the chip. And then we spatially offset these taps so that we encode the phase gradient of the light emitted out of these antennas. So overall, we have a system of 1,024 optical phase array based pixels with three encoding variables, the absolute phase, the amplitude, and the phase gradient of the light that's emitted out of each of these pixels. So how do we actually determine that encoding? Um, we use a holographic virtual image encoding methodology. And you can see here the viewing configuration for it. We would have that Viper display sitting here in front of your eye. And then you have this virtual image floating out in space, this holographic virtual image. So what's happening here is that the display isn't actually projecting information out into the world. What's happening is that the display is emulating the amplitude and phase fronts to create this virtual image here. It's emulating those amplitude and phase fronts at this point and then projecting those amplitude and phase fronts into your eye. And that allows you to see a virtual image floating out there in space, whereas those around you wouldn't be able to see it. Of course, how do we actually get those correct phase and amplitude fronts? Uh, we use a Gertrude Saxon algorithm to encode the app, um, uh, the amplitude phase and phase gradient uh, for all of these uh, pixels in the display. And this is um, the encoding to get this uh, uh, wireframe cube sitting a, a meter behind the display. So we fabricated this guy. You can see here that um, array here, we have the light coming from a Heaney laser. Uh, we have a setup that emulates the um, eye. So we have a lens that emulates emulates the um, lens in the front of your eye. And then we have a camera that emulates the retina in the back of your eye. 
And uh, of course, <laughs> we also looked through these chips. It was really cool. Um, but I don't think we're supposed to do that. Uh, so we use the setup and we characterize this chip and we can see this nice um, holographic image floating a meter behind the, the display. Um, so of course, we were, we were really excited to see this optical phase rays all working together. You know, this is a very large scale uh, visible light system, um, you know, creating this holographic image floating there in space. But of course, we don't want to just create a cube floating in space forever. We want to actually create a video hologram um, and have modulation of these images. And the real challenge is, as I, I mentioned earlier, we're using silicon nitride as our wave guiding platform here. Uh, silicon nitride has a very low thermal optic coefficient and effectively no electro optic properties. It's really hard to modulate visible light in these silicon nitride wave guides on chip. Um, so to get over that limitation, we actually had to develop new kinds of integrated visible light modulators. And specifically, we're using here integrated liquor crystal. So here's uh, our silicon nitride waveguide. Um, it's in an oxide cladding like this. And then on top of that waveguide, we place this liquor crystal material. And here we're, we're simulating the mode in that waveguide. You can see that it fairly strongly interacts with that liquor crystal. So now to get modulation, we specifically put this uh, liquor crystal in an oxide trench. And on either side of that trench, we pattern metal electrodes. And now we can apply a voltage across those metal electrodes to get modulation. Here's a cross-sectional view, and here's the top-down view of that waveguide underneath our liquor crystal trench with our metal electrodes. So when we don't apply any voltage, the molecules in that liquor crystal material, they align um, in the direction of that waveguide, and the light that's in the waveguide sees the lower index of the liquor crystal. And now we can go in, we can apply voltage across our integrated electrodes, and that uh, application of the voltage is going to cause those liquor crystal molecules to mechanically rotate in the direction of the applied electric fields, essentially across here. So we're going to rotate those liquor crystal molecules. And now this liquor crystal is a very strong birefringence. So now when the light passes through the waveguide, it sees the higher index of a liquor crystal, and the mode gets pulled up more into the liquor crystal region. So that affects the um, effective index of the mode in our waveguide. So by switching those voltage on and off, we can pull up and down that mode. We can change the effective index of the mode. And as the light propagates through this region, it's going to cause a change to the phase at the output of this phase shifter. It's OK? So we fabricated these guys. Um, here you can see results. My student Milica was leading this work, now uh, being taken over by my student Andres, who's actually uh, came here um, for undergrad, University of Rochester. I think he was in, in Yannick's group. If any of you guys know him, Andres Garcia Coleto. He's awesome. But anyway, he's taking over this work from Milica. Um, so we placed these liquor crystal phase shifters in a mux sender interferometer configuration. And then by applying the voltage across that, that integrated MZI, we can get phase shift of um, 36 pi in our 500 micron long device. <laughs> this corresponds to a two pi phase shifter length of only about 28 microns. Um, this is uh, especially significant when we look at comparable visible light phase shifters in silicon nitride that are based on thermal optic effects. Those are generally on the length scale of 100 microns all the way up to kind of the millimeter scale if you look at standard thermal optic phase shifters. So this is a, a couple, uh, at least an order or two of magnitude shorter than what we normally see. And this is especially important when we look at this AR display application, because we need small modulators to be able to make um, smaller pixel sizes to increase the resolution of our display. So we can take the same um, integrated liquor crystal uh, technology that we developed and now show the first uh, visible light liquor crystal amplitude modulators on similar length scales. We have our liquor crystal region up here. We introduce a second waveguide that acts as the tap. And by changing the width of these two waveguides and the length of that coupler and inducing some coupled mode theory, kind of uh, delta beta principles, we can get an um, equally compact, this is now only nine micron long device to get amplitude modulation with a pretty good <laughs> ratio of about 15 dB. 
So now we can take all these integrated liquid crystal components and we integrated them into an optical phase array configuration to show the first actively uh, tunable visible light optical phase array on chip. Um, so here you can see a schematic of what that guide looks like. We had uh, an input bus waveguide. We then tap off the light on that bus waveguide and go to an array of antennas on the chip. And now we place the liquor crystal phase shifting region on top. And now by applying a single voltage to that liquor crystal phase shifter, we can get um, phase gradient tuning to the antennas at the end of our chip here. Here's a photograph of, of that uh, chip packaged um, and my student Milica holding a little card on top of it. The, the chip is emitting light off of the, um, the phase array is emitting light off of the chip. You see the main beam that's formed. You also see a couple of higher order grading lobes that are formed. And then by applying a voltage using these little electrodes, uh, these little probes that we land on the chip, we can actually get that beam to steer around and do beam steering. <coughs> We can then take all these liquor crystal uh, devices and, and subsystems and integrate them together to create the active Viper pixel. So as a reminder, here's what that passive pixel looked like. We had phase encoding, amplitude encoding, and phase gradient encoding. And now we can create its active counterpart. So we put that liquor crystal phase shifter to encode the absolute phase. We can place that delta beta variable tap device to encode the amplitude of the light coupled into each pixel. And then we can place a very compact version of that cascaded optical phase array to take a, a bus here, tap off the light off the bus and encode the phase to our array of antennas there. And one thing I'll uh, want you to keep in mind is we actually have a little escalator device that's gonna vertically transition the, um, from the modulation layer to our antennas on an emission layer. Of course, we fabricated these individual pixels and we characterized them, they were looking good. So then we started working towards scaling up this display to multiple pixels. Um, here's one row of the display. You can see here the modulation uh, devices going to the antennas on chip. And here's the modulation devices of the second pixel, antennas of the second pixel and so on. So you have this very compact way of cascading them together, some fun system engineering. And then we can take the rows and we can actually vertically stack them on top of each other. So just for clarity, I'll highlight the different emission apertures of each of the pixels. And you can see here, because if you remember, we are transitioning to a different vertical layer for our antennas, we can actually place the antennas of the first row above the modulation layer of the second row. That's what allows us to have this very tightly integrated pixels for this active Viper display. We then fabricated a four by four version of this display. Here's uh, just the different pixels turning on and off, showing the amplitude modulation uh, capabilities. And then um, my students had a little bit of fun with it and they took the four by four display and spelled out the letters in, in the word light. So we're turning on and off the different pixels to, to spell out the letters. So uh, of course, this is a pro uh, first prototype of this kind of display, um, but it's already starting to get quite complex. Right, we have 16 different pixels in this, this display, and each of these pixels requires three analog voltages to drive it. So, I don't know, 16 times three, that's like around 50 analog voltages, <laughs> that's quite a bit. So the huge challenge now is how can we integrate electronics to drive this thing and really scale it up to thousands of pixels in this display. So we've been working in collaboration with Copen Corporation that does the um, backplanes for the Air Force AR display helmets, uh, thinking about how can we design a thin film transistor electronics backplane that uh, is co-integrated with our photonics. So you'll have to stay tuned for the, the results from there. So overall, this current Viper display, right, has efficient components for daytime AR display operation. Uh, it has a very compact form factor, just a single glass chip that could be integrated in a pair of eyeglasses for discrete and mobile use. And it's actually projecting holographic information to resolve this virgin's accommodation conflict and enable long-term usage of these displays. I think it's fun to think about what could be the broader impact of this kind of work. Maybe we could integrate many of these into a large scale um, integrated photonics based display, maybe create uh, transparent holographic TVs for the future. I think this is a fun thing to explore. Um, 
Maybe we have time for like a question or two, if anyone, I know that there was a hand back there that I uh, didn't get to. So like with the passive program, uh, it looks like, I guess, what is, that is a program, but it in the fraction efficiency. Yeah, so we can actually create, um, I didn't even get to this, but the, these antennas, a challenge with uh, silicon photonic antennas is that they're emitting kind of in both directions. Um, but we actually designed these guys to emit just in one direction. So we can get pretty much 100% of the light off of the chip um, towards the eye, uh, which is good both in terms of efficiency, but also um, for discreteness. So for the DOD, who's very interested in these kinds of things, they don't want information to actually project out into the world because someone could take some similar optic and be able to tell what kind of information you're projecting. Um, so yeah, we worked on these antennas to make sure that they're extremely efficient, both in terms of how much power you can just in general emit, but also making sure that they're only emitting upwards. That's a technical question. Yes. About I love technical the, questions. Uh, a lot of antennas. How to yeah. make sure that each of the power of one antenna is the same? Do you have different copy sections or are they? Yeah, that's a, that's a fabulous question. So you can even see from uh, this kind of diagram, how do we d make sure that the same amount of light goes to each one? We actually have to design these coupling regions so more, uh, so less light gets coupled to this guy and more of the percentage of light goes to this one because there's effectively like a cascading effect here. And this is something that you very much need to encode in your amplitude encoding for each of these little uh, tap couplers. So that's something in the passive demo. Of course, we hard coded it into our, our tap um, waveguides, but for an active demo, you would actually go in and, and be able to modify this based on the image that you actually want to project. So I guess I'm just a little bit confused. How exactly do you solve the accommodation problem without doing any like, eye tracking? If you don't know where the yeah. is. So if you think about how does your eye actually work, when you're staring at Jaime, <laughs> so if I'm really looking at Jaime here, and say this this beam is uh, in front of me, Jaime's in focus, but this beam is actually out of focus because it's really close to me. So the world doesn't need to know that I'm looking at Jaime. Jaime's, Jaime's in focus. Um, my eye actually, because the information, because the light is coming from Jaime, uh, it's actually um, in focus on my uh, retina because I set the lens in my eye with the little muscles in my eye to focus at that point. So for this guy, right, we're actually projecting holograms. So that means that the information is actually coming from some point in virtual space. So if the point is here, for example, and I'm looking at Jaime, this is out of focus, but that's, that's natural. Like you want things to be out of focus that you're not actually focusing on. And then once I shift my focus and I look back at my hand, this is in focus and Jaime's out of focus. But the idea with this um, display is that it can actually shift where that virtual plane is that we project information. So I could project information over there, but I could also project information over here with the same display. Whereas with current AR displays, it's a lot more challenging because they have a um, little uh, little display that sits on the side of your head. And then usually they have some kind of micro optic that just projects that display onto one plane. Right. And so you can't have information on many different planes. And that's why you have this virgin's accommodation conflict where your eye expects that the information is over there, but it's actually sitting here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then I guess, um, so it, it's, good, it's good that the technology allows for that adjustment, um, but the system doesn't actually know where to adjust the virtual plane unless it knows where the retina is actually focused, where the eye is actually focused. Yeah. So is that like the next step or like, well, there's different ways, there's, depending on what your application is, um, it's going to need different things. So for example, for Air Force pilots, which is one of the um, things that we're, the application spaces we're talking to for this, uh, they need information, some information needs to be far away and some information needs to be close. And there's gonna be different information far away, like out in the environment versus what's close, what's on their um, console. Uh, for doctors, for example, maybe um, maybe they actually do need to vary based on where they're looking. And so AR display uh, goggles now, they actually do LIDAR eye tracking. Um, 
So you could imagine <laughs> we're working on LIDAR and the AR stuff, so you could have a chip that's actually doing some of that. But it totally depends on the application, whether you actually want eye tracking to project the same information on a different plane, or whether you want the information to just live in the plane that you set it to and not vary based on where your eye is looking. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, with that, maybe I'll switch to the next section just for the sake of time. Um, so, so far, we've been talking about these optical phase rays. We've talked about um, beam steering optical phase rays for LIDAR. So the idea is that you emit light off the chip, you form a beam in the far field, you steer it around. For the uh, Viper project, we're now all of a sudden emitting visible light beams. They're still steering around, but there's many beams steering around together to create this hologram. But it's still emitting in the far field. But what we've been interested in as well recently is thinking about what you can do in the near field of these optical phase arrays. So again, in a standard optical phase array, you have your chip sitting down here. It's emitting light off of the chip, and it's forming this beam in the far field. And then if you apply that linear phase front to the antennas out of the chip, you can get that beam to steer around in the far field of the array. But what we can do now is we can take the uh, light that we're emitting out of the antennas, and we can apply a curved phase front, a hyperbolic phase front, and that allows us to focus the light into a very high intensity, tightly focused beam in the near field of the array. And this focusing modality opens up a slew of new applications for optical phase rays that were never really bef uh, explored before um, for both optical phase ray technology, but in general for the field of silicon photonics. So first optical trapping for, for biophotonics. So forget about the chip for a second. Just assume you have some kind of focus beam. If you have a focus beam of light, and then you have some tiny little microparticles around it, that microparticle is gonna get pulled into the focus of the beam. That's called optical trapping. And then if that beam moves around, um, the particle is gonna move around with it. That's called optical tweezing. This is a technique that was developed a, a couple of decades ago um, by Arthur Ashkin and led to a, just a slew of innovation for the field of biology. Right, people have been using this technique to trap viruses and bacteria, to understand their properties. They, it's been used for cell sorting, uh, taking DNA and stretching it to understand the mechanical properties of the DNA. Just a lot of innovation for biologists. Um, but the issue is that right, an optical trapping setup, that maybe some of you have seen it in the lab before. Um, usually it requires a lot of bulk optics which maybe the people that know how to ask these important questions in biology might not be the same people that are experts in optics. Um, except of course, Ben. Uh, so there's been a push towards integrated versions of these optical trapping systems where we have waveguides on the chip um, and use that to trap the beam. So people have been doing waveguide resonator-based trapping, like some printed micro-optics, photonic crystals for trapping. But the issue is that um, all of these integrated demonstrations so far have been limited to trapping kind of directly on the surface of the chip. And that's because these, uh, this trapping has been done, if you remember, we were talking about the evanescent field out of a waveguide, that little tail that's coming out of a dielectric waveguide. All of this trapping has been done using these evanescent fields to kind of pull in this light and trap it on, on the surface, which is great maybe for some demos, but for, you know, when you talk to biologists, and Ben and I were talking about this just like 30 minutes ago, um, when you talk to biologists that all of a sudden want to actually work with biological specimens, this might not be such an attractive solution. Uh, you're, if you have, actually have to put some specimens on this chip, you're going to um, contaminate the chip with every test. A lot of uh, biological uh, particles are also very sensitive, so they're, um, incubated, right, the, the cells, and they're sitting on some little glass cover slip, and they're gonna die if they kind of move around too much. Um, and these glass cover slips are on the order of uh, like 170 microns thick. So if you put this cover slip with the cells on top, on top of your chip, now you're way out of the evanescent tail of your wave gun. The evanescent tail is maybe a couple microns. So it would be very interesting for both these standard biological experiments to not have to contaminate your chips, maybe to be able to probe all the way up into a sample. It'd be interesting to set the um, focal height for these optical trapping to be much higher than the surface of the chip. I'm also especially interested in this idea of 
can we actually probe into the body with these optical traps as opposed to just being limited to sensing right on the surface? So with that, uh, we've developed an, the first uh, optical trap using one of these integrated optical phase rays, where we're actually emitting the light off of the chip and then focusing the beam in the near field about five millimeters above the surface of the chip. And then we can take different um, specimens. Here we're taking a microsphere uh, and we're trapping it using this beam emitted out of our optical phase array. And then we can beam steer, non-mechanically beam steer the array, and we can get that, that uh, sphere to... ...kind of an order of magnitude, or orders of magnitude higher uh, trapping distance for these um, optical phase array based optical traps. We can actually now show uh, the first biological experiments using an integrated uh, single beam optical trap. So here we have a cancer cell. Um, we kind of trap this little cancer cell turning on our laser, and then we can move the position of the laser and we can stretch out the cell to do optical stretching, move the laser back, and we have the cell recovering back to its initial state. I think it's very interesting to see where we could go with this kind of uh, technology where we're having such a large standoff distance for biological experiments while still keeping with the scaling of integrated photonics. Of course, once we start thinking about biology, immediately we start thinking about sensors, right? And especially wearable sensors. So now if I were to give you a chip and say, wear it, um, you know, you'd have your chip and the chip would be just sitting on your body like this. It wouldn't be very comfortable. So now wouldn't it be much, much better if we can make flexible chips that actually conform to your body, or maybe they conform to your clothing. Uh, so again, we've developed in collaboration with SUNY Poly, now the first 300 millimeter flexible photonic wafers, where we have our uh, silicon photonic devices and systems and we're now fabricated in a um, flexible photonics platform. Now this is work led by my student Milica with help from Andres and Ashton. Oh, I forgot to also mention the optical trapping was led by Tal uh, with help from Sabrina and Milica. So here um, Milica and Ashton took these chips, they subdivided them in individual triplets, and then they got like really quite a big finger workout. They took these chips and they bent them 2000 times around rods of different diameters. They're able to bend them uh, 2000 times around a rod about the, the size of your pinky and still see no degradation in the performance of the chip, which we thought was really exciting. So looking forward to see uh, kind of where this goes in the future. So another area where focusing uh, beams out of uh, chips could be really interesting is in 3D print. So if you think about a standard 3D printer, it's this big box that's plopping out little balls of plastic to create 3D objects. If you go to higher resolution 3D printers, they're laser based. And this is an example of what that looks like. It's called stereolithography, stereolithography based 3D printing. So you have this, uh, this box here. There's a laser at the bottom that's scanning around. And then you have this thin layer of resin that comes in. And the laser scans around and it cures 2D patterns in this thin layer of resin. And then this elevator platform here comes down and it picks up that first 2D layer of cured resin. The laser scans around again, creates another 2D layer. The platform goes down, picks up that second layer. And you have this layer by layer creation of 3D objects using these 2D, um, uh, 2D uh, cured resin um, uh, patterns. So this, is, this allows you to get very high resolution 3D prints, but the issue is that this 3D printer right, is sitting on top of your desk, it's about this big. So we've been thinking about, could you actually create a chip that does 3D printing? So take all of that functionality, but now integrate it into an optical chip. So we have this chip here, um, it's emitting beams or holograms out of the surface of the chip, and it's non-mechanically steering them around to actually cure uh, 3D objects using this uh, non-mechanical uh, chip solution. We believe that this is the first uh, proposal for actually a chip that's doing 3D printing. Um, so here's my student, Sabrina, who who's leading this work with help from Milica and Tal. And here we have the, the first 3D print created by actually a silicon photonic chip where we're steering the beam around and actually um, curing the MIT logo in, in this pattern. And then finally, this near field modality for optical chips could be a, a huge um, uh, advantage for different quantum systems. So if you look at different types <laughs> of qubits, one leading type of qubit is a trapped ion. So if we go into a trapped ion lab, um, for example, we've been in our, 
our collaborators' labs at Lincoln Labs, uh, you see this cryostat that's sitting in the center of the room. That's taking ions and cooling them down to very low temperatures. Um, and then there's like a room filled with optics about the size of uh, this area over here with just tables upon tables of bulk optics, um, all taking different wavelengths of light, preparing their polarizations, their powers, um, and bringing all those different wavelengths of light into this cryostat sitting in the center. And those different wavelengths of light are doing um, cooling, uh, state preparation, state excitation, and readout of these ions. So the issue is that it's a whole room of optics to address just a couple of ions. Um, so of course, you know, uh, intuitively we think there's no way we can scale up. Uh, if we wanted thousands of ions for a true quantum computer, it would take up like a whole mall right, of, of space. But actually the bigger issue that even our colleagues that, that are working on this now, they say the bigger issue is that this ruins the fidelity of these ions. So the issue is that these optical tables, they're all vibrating slightly differently. And the light paths then when they come in, they lose coherence when they come into this ion and that reduces um, the co coherence and fidelity of the uh, operations you're actually doing to um, uh, that ions. So we've been working in collaboration with MIT Lincoln Labs to uh, work on an integrated solution for um, this trapped ion addressing. We have the ion that's sitting up here. It's trapped actually with RF electrodes above the chip. And then we have different wavelengths of light coming onto the chip, emitting out of the chip and focusing on that ion to do different operations. And specifically my group uh, led by um, my students Ashton and Sabrina with help from uh, Tal and Milica, we've been looking at advanced cooling architectures. The, so thinking about, can we emit different polarizations of light off the chip to interface with these ions, which are highly sensitive to the polarization of light that's, that's uh, coming in. So we can create TE and TE polarizations, we can put in TE and TM, or we can even do interesting things with circular polarizations of light emitted off the chip to interface with that ion. And what's been really interesting and challenging for this program uh, is that ions, uh, in order to do this type of cooling, um, they actually need a very small wavelength, specifically 422 nanometers. So we've had to design these polarization rotators and splitters for the first time all the way down at blue wavelengths. Um, here we're, we're exploring different schemes, uh, mode conversion, uh, mode coupling, and then polarization splitting. So I think I, I just have a couple of more minutes. I thought um, it would be fun to talk through uh, a couple of education initiatives that we've had at, at MIT in addition to uh, things affecting learners nationwide and a collaboration with a lot of my colleagues here at University of Rochester. Um, so even though we have all these really fun silicon photonics things happening, at MIT, we actually never had a silicon photonics class um, in our department. So this past year, uh, I had the opportunity to develop a new class for our students. Um, I thought, okay, silicon photonics, you know, you guys are all optics. Optics uh, faculty and students. So I was like, okay, there's not gonna be that many students interested in silicon photonics. I was really Surprised and super excited. We we had um, like 52 students plus five postdocs that showed up for the silicon photonics class. And it was just so exciting, you know, in this age where we're talking so much about workforce development and getting students excited in electrical engineering hardware. It's so cool to see all these students excited to, to learn about photonics. Um, I think what was uh, really driving a lot of them to come to the class is um, we actually developed a silicon photonics hands-on teaching lab uh, where students could come. And we had a, a couple of different optical tables and actually probe stations, electronic photonic probe stations. We had some education chips um, developed uh, by my group where the chips followed along in the different uh, modules in the class. So waveguiding, coupling light onto the chip, splitting, uh, modulation, detection, a little system, um, which I think the students really enjoyed. And I love this photo here, especially. Uh, this is Mikey Tor. Uh, standing across the optical table from Ben, who's a senior uh, PhD student in one of my colleagues' labs. And they're both doing the lab, and I think they're both learning from it, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I think this kind of hands-on approach to learning really helps us get excited about what we're teaching and gives us some intuition. 
Um, uh, in collaboration with uh, Jaime and a couple of other um, faculty around the US, we, we developed some online actually going through and, and showing students how to do how, how, the theory behind these integrated photonic devices, and then also going into our different research labs and actually showing the equipment to do this and actually how you, you uh, um, uh, do some of these experiments. So here's my student Milica as a part of this class. Uh, she's talking you through how to test one of these integrated photonic modulators on chip, which has a little oscilloscope and whatnot. Um, so this is really fun. If some of you guys want to look into some of them, I think they have some nice student pricing. You can you can uh, um, enroll as a, a student in some of these hands-on um, education courses. We also have some in-person offerings. Uh, so I know um, both Jaime and Ben have been involved in this, where uh, Professor Kimmerling um, organized a whole group of us to do a summer academy where you go for a whole week and you learn all about the theory. And then kind of uh, in tandem to that, there's a winter boot camp where you can come back and you can actually see some of these experiments live. So my um, group worked with the uh, Kimmerling's group and we have um, some probe stations in our research lab where you go and you actually see how all these experiments are done. So with that, I'll wrap up. And we started out with beam steering optical phase drives for LIDAR sensors, looking at monolithic integration with lasers, 3D integration with electronics. We talked about this Viper program where we're creating visible light optical phase arrays, uh, the first visible light liquor crystal modulators, um, first uh, uh, visible light actively tunable optical phase arrays, then integrating them all together to create this AR transparent display. We looked at the near field of these optical phase arrays, showed trapping uh, for biophotonics, the first flexible 300 millimeter platform, uh, chip scale solution for 3D printers, and some. Um, interesting work in uh, trapped ion systems using these integrated um, emitters. So of course, none of this work would be possible without my fabulous students and team at MIT. Um, their, their hard work really enables all of, this work, uh, uh, all of these great results. Also give a shout out to some of our collaborators, Professor Joel Voldman for providing the cells for the bio experiment, um, the team at Lincoln Labs led by John Trevini for the trapped ion uh, atomic physics expertise. Um, SUNY Poly for the wafer fabrication for most of our programs, uh, Professor Vladimir Stanovich's group at Berkeley for the CMOS integration uh, design, um, UC Santa Barbara, Jonathan Klamkin's group for some of our new LIDAR efforts, which uh, I haven't been, uh, haven't been authorized to share with you guys yet, but maybe next time. Um, UT Austin, Zach Page's group for the resins that we use for our 3D printing work. And then of course, all the great faculty around the, the uh, US for some of these education initiatives, including uh, uh, Jaime and, and Ben. Um, so with that, I'd be super happy to answer some more questions. I can also stick around if, if people have any uh, questions I wanna discuss more. Um, one of the figures of merits in beam scanning is the um, response time to be able to scan around. Yeah. And then the other is the number of resolvable points in the scan. Yeah. So what's the response in the LIDAR system? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, what's the response time and what's the number of resolvable points? Yeah, so for, for these um, beam scanning systems, uh, they're, so I, I mentioned a lot of times we use thermo-optic modulators. So, so those can operate kind of on the order of hundreds of kilohertz up into megahertz. So that would be kind of your scanning time. But we can also use electro-optic modulators. So we've done that too, and that's in the gigahertz scan speed. Uh, but actually, when you talk with automotive um, companies, that fast of a scan speed up into gigahertz, which we can show, uh, that's actually a detriment because you need more power to drive the electronics that are uh, driving these um, electro-optic modulators. So often actually we use electro-optic modulators, but we only drive them to kind of megahertz speeds because that's really all that's needed for the autonomous vehicle applications um, and just take advantage of kind of the lower power uh, modulation provided by electro-optic. That, that's a fabulous question. But what's the number of resolvable points in the scan? Um, let me think about what's the most recent number. Uh, that we have. 
It's something on the order of like, I think here, um, about a hundred by some tens of points in the other direction. So like 10,000 points. Yeah. But that's all like super valid things that, that um, for these applications we need to think about. Uh, I have a question about the tolerances. I mean, as the number of components grows, yeah. we, we want to have some, you have some design and you want some design to be that way. Yeah. But in practice, it will differ from that. You won't get exactly that. Mm -hmm. So is there something you can do after tweaking? Or I mean, yeah. how, what kind of yield do you expect to get from these, these kind of multi-component things? I mean, I yeah, so there's, there's um, of course, you saw probably uh, when I pulled up that um, holographic cube image, there was a little bit of kind of funky business there, that's because that's a passive system. Right. And of course, there's going to be some uh, variation in the phase and amplitude emitted out because of these fab issues. Right. Of course, once we go to active systems where we can actively change things, then we can compensate for these issues uh, by actively encoding. So the change in some sort of active fashion, the voltage yeah. is applied and all that. Yep. So then you get the right phase you want to. Yes, get. exactly. So we, we often do some kind of uh, calibration algorithms. So um, of course, I didn't have time to show all this, but for the early work, a, cal a calibration algorithm to figure out what uh, phases to set for each of the intents. Also, if, if you guys are interested in learning more, um, we have another uh, journal paper in collaboration with Dwayne Bonning's group at MIT. Um, we had a conference and a journal paper where we explored these phase variations. Uh, it was just published a couple months ago in Optic Express. But important important topic once we really start scaling. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, something I was curious about. So you mentioned that to control the other dimension in your LIDAR scanning is you modulate the wave plane. I was thinking that that would have some effect on kind of the efficiency of your wave by coupling. And so you would a little bit of power when you and how much you copy when you change the wavelength. So I was wondering how much really you have to change the wavelength to kind of get the full range of directions that you really need. Yeah, so we need about a hundred nanometers or so, um, which is actually not so much for our coupling on the chip, but depending on what kind of architecture we use, of course, that's going to slightly change the efficiency of things. Um, this is a phenomenon usually called beam squint. Um, so we do see a little bit of drop in power when we go to uh, bigger angles, but usually it's only like about a dB. Okay, yeah. Hundred that much in that wave line. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that is a very important problem when we actually start thinking about the laser that's driving this thing, because you need actually um, a pretty, uh, you know, a, a, integrated laser that's able to span a pretty large range of wavelengths. So our collaborators, um, now we're looking at some more advanced LIDAR systems. So our collaborators and uh, Jonathan Klem's, Klemkin's group are doing some really nice work on thinking about integrated lasers for these systems. We'll start there and then go this way. <laughs> so it seems like uh, the optical phase array has the antennas that are all lines with the ridges. And uh, first of all, does that impart a uh, shape on your uh, your light that comes out, and it seems like they all come out as lines, like your pixels all lines. That that is true. Um, like when you let's also see. yeah, let me. Uh, there's some chalk. Um, chalk. Right. <laughs> nah, it's okay. So, uh, oh, here we go. Perfect. So what these systems look like, or what these antennas look like, um, is you have your waveguide coming in, and then you have these little perturbation scatters that look like these inward perturbations like this. So when you're talking about like the shape of the beam that's coming out, uh, it's actually a very important problem that we spend a lot of time designing. Um, if you have the same kind of strength of perturbation as you go along this antenna, you actually scatter a lot more here than later on in the antenna because you come in with 100% of the light in this waveguide. And if this scatterer, for example, is scattering 50% of the light, then 50% comes out here, 50% continues on. Again, 50% scatters here. That's 50% of 50%. So you have 25 scattering here, 
25 continues. 50% of that is 12.5, 12.5 continues. So you actually have this exponential shape to the emission, uh, the amplitude emission that's scattering out of this guy. Um, so what we can do is we can do some interesting designs where we can actually apodize the scattering strength here so that you have actually uniform emission coming out. You were also talking about like, maybe is it segmented because you have this, this kind of a uh, periodic behavior? So look at all the images, you have lines, lines, and you can up the pixels. Yeah, they, they, it's actually not segmented because these, these, uh, this period of this guy is um, less than a wavelength. Uh, so they essentially they kind of blend together. Um, maybe what, Oh, for that image, you're thinking about the one that spells out light. That was in the near field. That was actually different antennas uh, before they project out. See. So that's that's right. Oh, that's how we can have this kind of pressure about the antenna. I was wondering um, because usually if you have a grading, you have like you need to different direction. So maybe you meet upper, and at the same time you're in. Downward to the subject. Oh yeah, that's a good question. I was thinking how you can get like more light toward upward. Yeah, so um, this is a problem that I worked on actually when I was a um, a undergrad student, like a little baby Yelena. Uh, so what you can do for getting unidirectional emission out of these integrated antennas is you can do two layers of emitters. So now we're this was a top down view. Now let's look at kind of. Um, if the waveguide is propagating like this, this is upwards, this is downwards, let's take a cross-sectional view like that. So if you have a kind of two waveguides coming in, and then let's say we're, per we're perturbating these antennas fully. So you don't just have these little perturbations, you just completely cut them. So there's oxide, then silicon, oxide, then silicon. What you can do is you can actually offset the two antennas. So you can have Um, so these scattering points where it's scattering on the top and the bottom are offset by lambda over two, a uh, quarter of a wavelength. Or, uh, sorry, lambda over four. And then the vertical offset of the scatterers is also lambda over four. And now if you actually trace out the rays here, you're actually going to get constructive interference, uh, destructive interference downwards, constructive upwards. I think I drew that right. It might be flipped, but anyway, you get the idea. There's actually, if you offset the scattering points by lambda over four, uh, both horizontally and vertically, you get constructive in one direction, destructive in the other, and you can essentially cancel out the emission that's going towards your substrate and get 100% upwards. That's, I think, that question that you had in the back too, um, how we create more efficient antennas, it's <clears throat> something like this, because you don't want half of your power to get just be so thrown away. Start the wave guy near the antenna because if you have waveguide, two layer of waveguide together, they will couple each other, right? Yeah, well, actually, we, we um, kind of want coupling. We kind of create this uh, dual mode there where it's uh, kind of this, this mode that lives both in the upper and the lower layers, and then it kind of scatters half down, half up, half down, half up, and then gets constructive interference in one direction. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So first, I'd like to thank you for your uh, insightful presentation, uh, especially regarding the uh, the augmented uh, reality display. Uh, I know that you have a Alpha PA as well as a uh, Cos module inside your uh, your pixel. So, and my question is, for this type of display, as you scale up the number of pixels, I know if you want you want a high um, refresh rate as well as uh, um, and you have a lot of things. So how do you think the power consumption would scale in that case? Yeah. So um, with these liquid crystal modulators, they actually, the the modulator itself uses almost no power because it's effectively like a capacitive device. Um, you have these electrodes on either side and you have the liquid crystal region. And then you have a little bit of power usage when you switch, but it, it kind of in its steady state voltage, it's mm -hmm. actually using pretty much nothing because it's, it's capacitive. <laughs> The power usage would be more so on the driving electronics. Um, so I can't give too many details, but when we worked with Copen on designing the backplane for this guy, um, we're actually seeing that we can actually scale out to uh, a couple thousand pixels um, kind of with no problem with their kind of standard 
uh, fabrication and, and driving technology. Thank you. But it's it's all about the driving electronics in that case. Uh, I have a question about the like, full color version of the wiper. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, can you realize the, the full color by just a input a, a laser with a time changing wind lens, or you need to like use the like, space uh, multiplexing and uh, use the like the multiple pixel to emit a different color to realize the RGB and a bit bigger like that? Yeah. So, Perfect. Yeah. So as you guys probably noticed, all the images are red. <laughs> That's because we're just operating a single wavelength. So exactly like you mentioned, you'd actually want RGB, red, green, and blue pixels. Um, I can't give too many details now, but uh, you definitely cannot just put in uh, the three different wavelengths and expect that the system is going to project the right things because all of these different integrated photonics components are designed for the wavelengths um, that you're operating with. Uh, so we have some fun architectures for the red, green, and blue that actually are able to integrate all three. Um, so we have a paper that's hopefully going to be published very soon, pending uh, some uh, reviewer comments. Um, so you'll get to see them. But yeah, definitely not. Uh, you definitely can't just put in the same wavelength into the system. But it's, a, it's actually a very interesting problem because there's multiple facets to it. It's about kind of the system architecture, like you're asking about how do you actually get these different pixels. But then also for integrated photonics, it's pretty hard to get uh, waveguide propagation down to blue wavelengths. So it's also about the materials. Um, then, of course, once we start integrating lasers, you have to think about how to integrate all three of those in like a, some kind of monolithic or uh, heterogeneous bonding something, three, five, one and dot something on the chip. It's how large is your pixel, your pixel color? Um, like a space multiplexing, so pixels full are that will you know degrade the resolution. Yeah, so um, so it's a, a bit of a separate question between pixel size and resolution. So the size of the pixel is about thirty microns, but actually the resolution of the image, uh, like the pixels in the image, it's a very it's actually decoupled from the size of the pixels in the display, because if you think about it, um, if you have some aperture, uh, and then you want to create information at different focal planes. Uh, from your optics classes, you know, if you have some aperture and you want to create an image um, at this plane versus all the way down there, the airy size right, is going to be different. Um, because we're not actually creating images on the display plane, if we take our current display size and we create a spot about a meter away, that spot's going to be five microns, whereas we have pixels in our display that are 30 microns because they're actually focusing the light down. Of course, if we wanted to project further away, then the minimum spot size is going to be bigger. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a kind of tricky question that when we're talking with like um, Meta or Google, right? When we're we're talking about resolutions, and they're like, okay, what's the resolution? Then we actually have to explain to them because there aren't, you know, the AR technology isn't normally doing this kind of thing. You actually have to understand um, how that resolution scales. It's a little bit different. So I think I think given the time, we should probably actually stop questions there. Although certainly, if Yelena can stick around a bit, and yeah, let's stick around for questions. Wow. But uh, let, let's thank Professor Norosh again for a terrific talk. Thank you.